And it, this was not a one-dimensional. Every, we had Benny King on the show, and right down the line, to a man, everyone said, you know, it was tough getting your money in those days. Mm -hmm. And I guess Harold Melvin was no different in that respect. Mm -hmm. He, uh, he had his way you yeah. know, <laughs> of making sure that he got his first, <laughs> and that everybody else was a paid hired hand. <laughs> so, right. I was a paid hired hand, but again, uh, from the perspective of a learning experience, it was a wonderful learning experience. Sure. I wouldn't have changed it. Just during the time when you're going through it, right. you go, "Oh man, this is this is crazy," <laughs> you know. And you didn't feel I didn't feel I was getting my just dues, and all the things that a lot of people have gone through. But uh, it actually was a wonderful experience. I got a chance to see things from the ground up and begin to understand what things are, how they are, how they should be, what not to do, what what you should do, and that is what at some point prompted me to say it's time to leave, but I didn't leave until I understood what it was I needed to do and what to do and what not to do. Sure. You learned the business I learned during that period. Yes. Uh, a lot of our viewers watching uh, today uh, are probably not aware of this next fact, and that is that uh, you're about to make a, not a major comeback, but what they probably don't know is that you really don't need the, the music, you don't really need to make a comeback and that you are and have been a very successful entrepreneur in the Philadelphia area. And that music, you're doing it for other reasons, but not, not for the money, really. Well, um, my, I'm sure we'll get back to this, but for 19 years uh, after my injury, I had begun to reestablish myself and reinvent myself in other ways because when I had the car accident, of course, that took away my immediate money earning capacity which <laughs> right. was stage performing sure so after I cried and boohooed and was depressed about that for a couple of years I needed to figure out how to pay bills <laughs> and how to continue to live in the lifestyle or somewhat right. of the lifestyle that I had become accustomed and it kind of started there and I began to make phone calls and take advantage of opportunities and different things now, my success as an entrepreneur is hardly the kind of success that one might go, God, he's hundreds of million dollars. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. I was able to pay my bills. You pay your uh, bills and I you got into real estate. You know, that like was I the was main bit. Other businesses, it, but real estate was the main one. kind of got into a little bit of that. And uh, it just kind of, things just started taking on, you know, little wings. Sure. And I began to kind of find a way to make a living, carve out a living, nothing, you know, that I would call the magnitude that right. people might want to think I had or okay. want to think I achieved, but I was able to pay my bills and pay my taxes. And of course, when you got into the real estate, Philadelphia was going through sort of a renaissance, so it was a good time for you. It's a great time. Now, whether I was involved in that renaissance, hmm, I don't think I was involved in it like I could have been or should have been. But as I said, I was, I was able to carve out somewhat of a living for myself that at least kept the lights on and was able <laughs> to uh, be able to take a vacation now and then. So it's okay. It's okay. Teddy, when you had your solo career, I did want to mention that that started around 1976. And you scored big right from the start with songs, which, again, they play all the time. Uh, I Don't Love You Anymore, Close the Turn Off the Lights. Oh, that's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Classic. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you were at the pinnacle of your career, I would think, in recording and live performances. And then March, I guess, 18th, 1982 mm -hmm. happened and uh, changed your life forever. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't stopped you. Mm -mm. It um, temporarily held me up. And I say that now. <laughs> at, at the time... I thought my world had crumbled, and my world had crumbled. Um, it's very difficult to think about. It's very difficult to talk about. However, after 20 years, it's easier. I, I can look back on it because I've been able to move forward sure. in spite of it. But, yeah, my world tumbled and crumbled, and um, I thought that was the end. I did not think that there was anything else that could happen or I could ever be successful in anything else. Uh, however, um, after that time, I began to talk to people and talk to some important people who was able to get me a renewed spirit. And I had a great support system in my life that mm -hmm. was 
able to let me be and go through what I need to go through and still made me feel like a viable individual who had plenty of um, opportunity or plenty of potential and things like that. So with that, it didn't leave me any alternative but to feel like I'm not going to let this stop me. I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to take every opportunity I come across in order to move forward in my life. Sure. Uh, when, when the accident occurred, uh, you were in a coma for eight days. You woke up on your 31st birthday. 32nd. 32nd birthday. Mm -hmm. At that time, were your thoughts, did they uh, go towards ever performing again, or just were you, you, you just wanted to, to survive? Well, um, I'm hearing it was a coma. I don't know. It's when I was cognizant you were. of what was going on was when an ear, nose, and throat doctor who is still a very good friend of mine sang happy birthday, came in the, in the room and sang happy birthday. And, I mean, I heard it just as loud and clear. It's when I recognized where I was. And I just was not, I don't know if it was because I didn't choose to or whether I was in a coma. I, I'm not clear on that. Mm -hmm. And I really don't want to try to dig up those facts. That's right. not important to me. What is important is from the day that I was, that I recognized uh, where I was and what I was going through was the day that I decided or I realized that things had changed. Mm -hmm. Nothing was the same. It was never going to be the same. Um, it's not fast forward to here you are. Again, there's 20 years. Sure. So in 20 years, I've gone through many, many, many trials, many tests, many um, thoughts, many feelings, many emotions, and a lot of those emotions was, well, um, if I ever get a chance, uh, will I be able to do this again? And for me, because I have had so many challenges, I thought, hmm, I'm going to try to, if I get a chance, I'm going to get back on the horse. I'm going to ride again. It was just something <laughs> I threw out at myself. Uh, whether I could do it, whether whatever happened, I didn't know. I have no clue, um, but it's something that I said, which said to me, which made me believe that if ever the chance came, and I felt that it was it was an opportunity that I could take, I'm going to do it. And that opportunity came uh, in 1985. That was with Live Aid. Absolutely. And you were call, uh, called on stage. You were on stage with, if I remember correctly, that was a huge event, mm -hmm. Ashman and Simpson. Mm -hmm. I was asked by my then manager, Shep Gordon, if I wanted to uh, participate. <laughs> and uh, he was the same person that said to me, oh, I guess about a year or so after I was injured, tell you it's not how you fall down, it's how you get up. Mm -hmm. And those words rang so clear to me, and it rang so true to me, because at the time I was very depressed. One of the things that depressed me so much was while I was in we have said, I read an article, and the headline was, who will be the next Teddy Pendergrass? Mm -hmm. I felt, oh, my God, I've been discarded, I've been thrown away. You're out of here. So, you know, part of that was, part was my depression, and then a lot of it changed once I heard the words, it's not how you fall down, and get up. it's how you get up. And that along with, like I said, all the support system that I had around me, my family, and a few close friends, and some my, my immediate family, some relatives, um, I was able to see things a little bit differently. Uh, I got to seek help, professional help. Mm -hmm. I've gone through it all. Um, so I was able to say, if I get the opportunity, I'm going to take it. So my manager said, um, there's going to be a big event in <laughs> Philadelphia. Um, it's called Live Aid. And he told me everything about it. He said, I can get you on it. <laughs> um, do you want to take the chance? And knowing me, I take chances. I've <laughs> always taken chances. That's why I explained to you about leaving in Canada when I didn't feel it was right. Yeah. I took the chance. Didn't know if I was going to get home, mm -hmm. but I left. Mm -hmm. And I left the blue notes. I didn't know what was going to happen. So I said, okay, here's another chance. I need to, I need to know what people are going to think about me. If I'm ever going to have a chance at this, I need to know for me what people think, how they're going to react. So I said, okay, I'll do it. I had no idea of what, who, what, when, or where, but I did know 